on the spot takes you to two countries on one street. If any of you are statistically minded, here's a fact of interest. There are 5,527 miles of border separating Canada and the United States, including Alaska. Considering this, one could be pardoned for being surprised that there aren't more border incidents. There are incidents, of course, but local ones, mostly caused by the fact that in about 75 places along the border, there are buildings that stand in both countries. You even have a jail and stores and houses and where it's quite possible to grow up and not know what country you belong to. Well, On the Spot is going to take you to such a place in Quebec's eastern townships where the line was first surveyed in 1771 when both Canada and the United States were colonies of Great Britain. For over 70 years there was disagreement about the border at this point until finally Lord Ashburton and Daniel Webster got together in 1842 and settled the matter. And their treaty, while it didn't please everyone, at least settled the matter for once and for all. But it left some very unusual situations in its wake, as you will see. He drives an old blue Plymouth sedan, 1941. Here's his plate number. Well, what's his reason for crossing the border so often? I think I've seen that car hanging around the back roads. There's his visiting relatives. We searched his car and found nothing. If you can, keep an eye on him and see if he loads up with anything. Sure, glad to, Ben. We are watching that the Ben and Fireman fight was road. You know the one I mean. The bond railing that runs through the barn. He might be mixed up in something. Okay, Ben. This is Bob Anderson of the National Film Board doing a little eavesdropping in a Canadian customs house on the Quebec-Vermont border. I'm interested in smuggling as who isn't, who's ever crossed an international boundary line. And I'm hoping something develops while I'm here. These gentlemen are mounted police, customs, and U.S. Border Patrol. You're uh, the man with the six-shooter here. You're a federal officer, Mr. Deshaw. Yes, we work for the Department of Justice. And uh, what's the nature of your job? Well, patrolling the international border, watching for aliens that enter the United States illegally. You look for aliens, we look for cigarettes. Uh, do you ever get mixed up with our fellows? Oh, yes. When we have information for them, we make a trip over to see them. And lots of times when we're patrolling on the back roads, we uh, watching for a car, and it turns out to be the Mounties. I'd hate to get caught in between you. What about the amount of police job along the border? Well, actually, we're mainly concerned with the patrolling of the border in order to prevent American goods from coming into this country illegally. So you act as the enforcement officers for... The Customs and Excise Division. Oh, right. well, what about the Customs man, Mr. Miller? Well, this is a Frontier Highway Office. We issue motor vehicle permits. We collect revenue. We search cars. And we try to enforce the various customs laws and regulations. Well, thank you, gentlemen. You will let me know now if anything develops. Oh, yes, I will. Good. Thanks, Mr. Miller. I'll see you later. Yes, I'll see you. Oh. Well, I'll keep my eyes open and let you know what happens. Well, it's very nice to meet you. Yeah. Good hunting on your side of the border. Okay. See Good you later. You. Bye. Well, I'm standing on Canusa Street in Bibi, Quebec, just near the Three Villages, which is our destination. This is certainly a most unusual kind of location. The international boundary runs diagonally up this street its whole length. And the people who live on the right live in the United States, and the people who live on the left live in Canada. And they're across the street neighbors. And that's really all the boundary is right here. And even up above us here, the flag flying on the flagstaff of the Canadian Customs, across from the American Customs, when this Canadian flag flies, it actually flies partly in the United States. The name of the street, Canusa, is a contraction of Canada and USA, and there's no barbed wire separating the Canadians on one side and the Americans who live on the other side of the street. Hey girls, this is Faith, Hope, and Charity Greenwood, and they're Americans. Uh, what do you do when you cross the street? Do you have to report? Well, we're supposed to legally, but we don't. 
And uh, what if you go shopping in Canada? Well, if we buy a loaf of bread in Canada, we have to report through the Canadian side over, and then on the way back for the loaf of bread, we have to report through Canada and into the United States Customs. Well, what about if you go to Canada and, and uh, come back and you haven't done any shopping? Do you report? Well, we do. we're supposed to, but I sometimes do and I sometimes don't. And I never do. But where are you going now? We're going to our next door neighbor. At the other end of Canusa Street are two gas stations facing each other, one in Canada and one in the United States. Now, uh, this one is uh, in the States, and uh, the gas here is 32 and uh, 30 cents a gallon. Across the way, it's 44 and 46 cents. Of course, the uh, gallon's larger there. Rock Island and Stansted in Quebec's eastern townships and Derby Line in Vermont are collectively known as the Three Villages. They look all like one town, but they lie in two countries. There is an international boundary here, but you have to look pretty hard to find it. You can look down one of these streets and not be at all sure whether you're in the United States or Canada. Because there is no international boundary that's clearly visible, it runs right through many of the buildings that are both in Derby Line, Vermont, and Rock Island, Quebec. Without the signs to remind you, you just wouldn't know you'd crossed an international boundary. We know the United States is up that way because the signs say so. And the puzzle is to find out where this international boundary is. It's not an easy job either. This shop is in the United States, must be, because there they sell American cigarettes and other American goods. Now, just a moment. I think we're getting warm. There's something across the street there that looks like a hitching post. Yes, this is it. This is the international boundary post. Uh, this truck, which works for the Canadian Pacific Railway, or Express, is bisected right now by the international boundary. The boundary runs right in between the barber shop and the Canadian Pacific Express. As a matter of fact, the Canadian Pacific Express is just cut in two by the international boundary. The Haskell Library and Opera House are just about as international as you can get. It sits right on the boundary line. You enter from the United States and get your books in Canada. In the Opera House on the second floor, the stage is in Canada, and most of the audience sits in the United States. The churches draw their congregations from both sides of the border, some of them just about equally divided between the states and Canada. It's quite possible to cross between one town and the other by the back streets, but if you do so without reporting to customs, you pay a fine. The Tawafobia River starts in the United States and wanders in and out of both countries with very little regard to the international boundary. And the factories that line it are partly in one country, partly in the other, and some are cut right in two by the international boundary line. The Butterfield Division of the Union Twist Drill Company is the largest industry in the three villages. Here is the boundary post here. The line cuts right through the factory here. This is the American factory. The power is imported from Canada to run it. The overpass is the only connection with the Canadian factory. That truck is now straddling the line. In order to move anything from the Canadian plant to the American plant would require about a two-mile trip through the customs. In these plants, we manufacture taps, dyes, reamers, twist drills, and milling cutters. The Canadian plant is the largest of its kind in the country devoted exclusively to the manufacture of cutting tools. The two plants are run entirely separately with one common administration. We employ both Canadian and American workers on both sides of the line, maintaining equal wages, which gives the Canadian workers a break. Bill, this is Bill Denny, who has a house on the line just the same as our plant here. 
I thought you might like to meet him. I'd like to see that house. Well, you'd be welcome to. I'm going home to lunch shortly, and I'd like to have you come up. Thank you very much. You're welcome. Out of their living room window, the Denny's see the United States. In fact, this part of the house is in the States. Derby Line, Vermont, which you see up the hill. The focal point of the living room is the TV set, and it's an American one. Bought, of course, at a considerable saving. They can only look at it in this room. If they moved it to any other part of the flat, they'd have to declare it and pay the duty. The international boundary runs right through this end of the Denny's kitchen. The washing machine stands just over the line in the States, but they use it in Canada where the sink is, so they bought a Canadian one. The stove and the refrigerator would have been cheaper in the States, but not after you've paid the duty, so they're Canadian. The table and chairs are American, because Mrs. Denny liked the model, and because even with the duty, they were cheaper. The duty had to be paid because they used three feet over the border in Canada. They have a Canadian telephone, because the rates are cheaper in Canada. In an international house like this, it doesn't matter which side of the line the actual phone is on, so long as the bells ring in Canada. Well, Mr. Miss Denny, we've just had a very nice lunch over there in Canada, in the kitchen. Now we're sitting here relaxing in the United States before you have to go back to work, Mr. Denny. Yes. How does it feel to live in a house divided like this between two countries? I never really think it is divided between two countries. Uh, I often look out and see the American flag up in Derby Line, and then I see our Union Jack on the Canadian customs, and I really never think too much about it. Mm -hmm. Things pretty well mixed up, it's yes. the community. Yes. We'd be yes. used to it, uh, our fraternal societies and uh, the uh, uh, service groups are composed of members from both sides of the line here. Yes, we're like a big happy family, yeah. actually, right here on this border. Yes. What about the boys? Where do you go to school, boys? In Rock Island. And where do you play? In the summertime, we play baseball in the United States at Baxter Park. In wintertime, we play hockey over the arena in Canada. Well, I understand you've got 17 hockey teams in Rock Island, is that right? Yes. Well, hockey's a Canadian game. Look, uh, what about, the, are there any uh, differences between the boys in... Uh, Derby Line, the boys in Rock Island? Yes, they speak different. And the word they are and here, they'll say they are and here. Is that so? They are and here. <laughs> well, you wouldn't expect a difference like that in a, in a towns close together, would you? No, you wouldn't. Uh, Miss Denny, where do you do your shopping? Well, we buy nearly all our food in Canada because we find a lot of it is cheaper. The milk, for instance, is five cents cheaper quart. And of course, we get an extra cup. So yes. <laughs> and then the bread also is uh, cheaper. Larger loaf, too. Well, I didn't expect there would be differences like that. Oh, well, yes. Now, uh, you're not the only family living in a house like this on both sides of the border. No, the, there are uh, several families that are situated uh, like well, this. Well, in fact, a very good friend of ours, uh, Mr. Novia, lives in an international house. Uh, by the way, uh, Mr. Novia is chief of the U.S. immigration. Just up the hill? Just up the hill here, yes. Well, I think maybe we ought to see him. We came into your house through the United States. We didn't bother reporting to uh, customs or immigration up here. Uh, Perhaps he wants to see us. Well, it would be a good idea, anyway. Well, we've got to have a talk with him. Thanks. <laughs> I'm really not conscious of uh, living on the uh, border in a house directly on the international boundary line. The only time that I was conscious of it, when I first moved there, I found this table on the Canadian side uh, wrapped in newspapers and upon unwrapping it I found that it was made in Canada and I felt it my duty to report it to the United States Customs where a small duty was paid on that table. Mr. Burke is head of United States Customs here. Do you have anything to declare? Well, yes, I do have something to declare. I can declare I don't feel any different on this side of the line than I feel on the other. Mr. Burke, is this a busy port? Yes, it is a very busy port. For example, during the month of August this year, we processed approximately 40,000 vehicles. And during the last fiscal year, we processed approximately 288. Hi, Ed. Hello, Uncle. Hey. You're acquainted with Mr. Struthers, the collector of Canada Customs and the mayor of Stansted? Certainly am. Good morning, Mr. Mayor. 
Uh, do you often come to this foreign country? Almost every day. Bill, Rocco, and I have a lot in common. I can see that. I just talked to the Mounties, and that smuggling case is getting pretty hot. Good. Thanks Thank very you. much. Well, if you gentlemen have business to do, as I imagine you have, if you excuse me, there's a sign outside your custom house I want to have a look at. Bill and I have got to check on export here. Well, I'll see you all later. Thanks for clearing me through. Not at all. Where will you be in a few minutes? Uh, I'll be in customs with Mr. Struthers. Well, stand by. We'll pick you up before long. All right, good. Where people report and pay duty on things they're bringing in. Everybody has to report here. That's correct. Even the local people. That's right. Uh, I understand that if you've been in the United States for 48 hours, you can bring back $100 duty free. That is correct. Once every four months. Yes. Uh, what about these local people? Do they benefit from this, uh, living right on the border? Sure, just the same as any other Canadians. And I suppose being related to so many people across the border, it's a fairly easy way to, uh, at least an easy job to find a place to stay. Yes, just stay with the relatives, and in fact, they come with their exemption. Move a couple of blocks away, and... That's what it amounts to, yes. Uh, these uh, are mainly, I suppose, local people who've made purchases in the States and are declaring them now. They are. They've bought goods in Derby Line, and now they're paying duty on them here. You wish to pay duty on this, uh, something, saw fellow? Yes. And how much did you pay for this, please, in the States, sir? Six ninety-five. Six ninety-five. Uh, do you have a bill from the store where you no, purchased no, it's this? No, it's in the box here. It's marked on the box, eh? Okay? Hmm? How long have you been in the States, sir? Fifteen minutes. Fifteen minutes. Yeah. Mr. Struthers, uh, I understand that if I want to, as much as I might want to, uh, import a mongoose or uh, an old mattress or some egret feathers, I can't do it. Uh, is that true? How'd you find that out, our book? I'm afraid I've been peeking, yes. That's true. I've been surprised to uh, find that there are so few items absolutely prohibited. There are only 18 in the tariff. Now tell me, if I go down to the States uh, in my car, um, and come back over with my exemption, you know, uh, having been there 48 hours. Uh, can I bring anything that I can pile into the car? The criterion is what one would take with them on the train or check his baggage. So that means that uh, if I want to bring in a radio, I can only bring in a small one. That's correct. You couldn't bring a console radio. But uh, if I wanted to bring in a bicycle, uh, an awkward item like that, I could. But not a motorcycle. Well, I know that you can check a canoe on the train. I could bring that in. But eh? not a rowboat. Then what there's else? a question of a uh, carpet, uh, I mean a uh, rug. You could bring one that could be folded into a small package, mm -hmm. but you couldn't shoulder a linoleum and bring it in. I see. So it really depends. Your criterion is then what you can carry as baggage on a train. That's correct. Um, I'd like to ask about some immigration uh, matters. Uh, Mr. Quillenon, who's in charge of the immigration service, will uh, answer your questions. Good. I'll be seeing you later. Okay. Well, sir. Yes, sir. In this uh, strange, mixed-up community where you have the border running even through houses, I suppose you must run into cases where people uh, don't really know what they are, one, one citizenship or another. It has happened. They lived, lived uh, grown up without knowing what citizenship they, they had. Mm -hmm. have, you, have you got cases that around here? We certainly have. One here standing right beside me, whose father-in-law status. It was mixed up for years. So you didn't know whether whether he was Canadian or American, huh? Well, uh, start off, he uh, wasn't quite sure. They took quite some time for them to really decide whether he's a Canadian or American. And he came under the same regulation as uh, most children are born in the United States. Uh, these old houses uh, were built on the line years ago. And this house was built with the front part, the front door and uh, uh, front room in the in Canada, and the rest of the house was uh, divided by the line. They, it was in the United States. Mm -hmm. The bedroom in where my father-in-law was originally born and, well, 70 years ago uh, was divided by the line, and uh, after a lot of conferences between both the immigration services, it was decided that he was an American uh, due to the fact that two-thirds of the bedroom was in the United States. <laughs> <laughs> well, I guess you don't run into much of that kind of thing anymore. It's pretty well straightened out, I suppose, no, now. And I understand that even now, most of the children who are born in this community are born in the United States, in uh, Vermont. I should say the majority are. Why is that? Well, 
The nearest hospital is in Newport, Vermont, nine miles away. Yes. The nearest one in Canada is 31 miles away at Sherbrooke. Well, that makes quite a difference. I can understand that. Well, now, are these babies born there, uh, are they Canadians or Americans, or both? Actually, they are recognized as citizens of the United States by the United States and by Canada until they have been admitted here and have been registered as Canadian citizens. This must be done within two years of the date of their birth. Otherwise, they're just treated as immigrants. That right? is right. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you very much, gentlemen. I'm going to go along and see Mr. Struthers. Right. See you later. Mr. Struthers, I have the general impression that people like to try to beat you customs people. Do you think people are at heart larcenous? No, I don't. I think most of them are honest, and we try to keep them honest by spot checks and rather more careful checks sometimes. Mm -hmm. What about uh, conscience money? I understand this has happened. The people have sent some in. Yes, I've received $75 cash and twice $30 and several smaller amounts, even one of 25 cents, a shin plaster, a lad sent me. Is that so? When uh, you discover goods in a car that haven't been declared, what happens? Well, we seize both the car and the goods, but we give the opportunity to the people to make a declaration first. And if they fail to do so, we take both car and goods. I thought that only applied when uh, you were trying to get over goods of unusual importance or something uh, very illegal like drugs. No, according to the Customs Act, any goods not declared are seizable in the vehicle containing them also. And uh, last year we had 35 seizures of that type. Must be a very sad thing. People lose their cars. I think this smuggling business must be expensive. Yes, sometimes we had a rather humorous one about a year ago, uh, a great big man had a very little car, and it was decorated with all sorts of ornaments, even had a, an antenna, antenna when they didn't, he didn't have any radio. And then uh, it's all sorts of doodads, two foxtails on the antenna. He came to me twice to see his car and uh, said he we wanted to see more. Did he sure? Yes, we seized it because he had Oh, I think about 22 cartons of cigarettes up under the hood, and he didn't declare them. Oh, so Montpichar, he was Mont very Char was lost. He lost his little car. C'est triste. Yeah, c'est triste, bien triste. What about this um, business? How, how do you know who to look for? How do you know who to suspect? Well, the officers who have been in this work for a good long period acquire six cents. Well, I can understand people being a little nervous when they try to get away with something going through customs, but you mean something more than that. Yes, through the years, the officers acquired quite a bit of intuition and uh, are able to pick out people who are smuggling. Come out the window and have a look. See, this car is a local and may only take a minute or so. He's on his way now. This other one looks more interesting. Why, is he a strange one? Yes, and the officer's going to give him more of a look over. He'll possibly check him quite closely. Uh, here's your mounted police car to take you out. Oh, good. That means something's happening. I'll we'll see, see you, you later. later. There are roads all through these hills here, going from the state to Canada, and we have to patrol them all. We've been watching an abandoned farm lately, and we have a look out there just now. Portable to car 40. There are two cars there now. You better get here fast. Roger, portable. We'll be there in a minute. Like them, all right. Looks like quite a load, too. You want to have a look? Thanks. 
Hey, they're starting to move. Well, let's go with them. Let's go. Get him? Oh, yes, he hasn't got a chance. He'll be back in a minute. Let's see what he's got. Cigarettes? Yeah, quite a little, too. Cigarettes have we on the station? Well, approximately $200,000. They have to have compensation to make sure. Well, this is just a small part of the 200,000 cigarettes that came out of that smuggler's car. Mr. Struthers, what happens to all these cigarettes you seize at the border? They're held pending the decision of the Minister of National Revenue. And once forfeited, we send them to veterans' hospitals. In one year, we sent close to two million cigarettes to veterans' hospitals from Victoria to Halifax. Well, I'm glad you leave it to the veterans to burn them and that you don't just burn them here. I don't suppose you'd... Uh we certainly yes, uh, should, because those cigarettes are very carefully checked. Well, that's all right. The international border is only half a block away, and I happen to be going over to Derby Line for dinner, so... Uh, be sure and report when you return. I should mention that uh, if you do uh, consider bringing cigarettes over the border, you stand a good chance of not only losing them, but of losing your car as well, which uh, makes it a little more serious. And on this uh, none-too-happy note, this is Bob Anderson saying goodbye from Rock Island, Quebec. On the Spot is a production of the National Film Board. Two Countries, One Street was directed by Jean Palardy. The photography was by Jean Roy. The sound recording, Julien Coutelier. Film editor, Marion Meadows. Supervising editor, David Mayorovich. The producer, Robert Anderson. <laughs>